Hi Bearcats and welcome to chapter 9. So today we're going to cover cancer, osteoporosis, and diabetes. Now I know some of these we've already covered in different parts throughout the uh, throughout the course so far. We've touched on each of those a little bit. We are going to take a deeper dive into cancer uh, and you'll see why and how prevalent that is in terms of leading causes of death uh, and certain ways and measures that we can take to prevent uh, our uh, risks of cancer, developing certain types of cancer. Even though not all of it is preventable, some of it is her hereditary and et cetera, um, but there are some specific measures that we can take to protect ourselves uh, or at least detect the uh, stages of cancer early uh, so we have a higher success rate. Um, so that's what we're going to cover today. And then again, we're also going to touch a little bit on diabetes and osteoporosis as we get towards the end of this chapter. So again, this is chapter nine. This is the beginning of the third unit. Uh, so we're approaching the uh, last part of the semester. The third unit will contain chapters 9, 10, 11, and 12. And that's the information that will be used on the third exam as we approach the end of the semester. So let me switch over here to the PowerPoints and we will jump right in with chapter 9. Okay, so here we are, chapter 9. Uh, we're going to start focusing on cancer first. So the probability that you will develop or die with cancer in your lifetime Women, that's a one in three chance. Men, one in two. So if you're sitting somewhere where there's other people, I want you to look around. If, if you're a woman, look at two other women in that particular room and yourself. The odds are one of you three women will develop cancer in your lifetime. Men, that's even a higher risk. So men, if you're in a room with somebody else right now, look around and find one other man. And the likelihood is that one of you two will develop cancer within your lifetime. So we can see that it is a growing concern. Um, you know, it's certainly not something to take lightly. Uh, I think we can probably all, uh, you know, consider the fact that we've all had family members or people that have been close to us that have been affected by cancer, some form of cancer, type of cancer. So it is something that we need to pay, pay uh, particularly close attention to because it does affect so many people in our world. Uh, it is the number two killer of Americans behind heart disease. Uh, and you'll see some more information on that uh, here in a few minutes. So what is cancer? It's a disease caused by uncontrolled growth and the spread of abnormal cells. Um, so they continue to grow and maybe you guys have heard how somebody might have developed cancer and it has spread to other parts of their body uh, because <clears throat> that's what those abnormal cells do is they grow and spread. Um, it is a tumor or neoplasm, which is a group of cells, and it can be either benign or malignant. So the number of deaths in terms of leading cause of death. So if you look at the top two, we have heart disease, which we have already covered throughout this semester, and we have cancer. But I want you to look at how close those are in terms of numbers. We have 596,000 to 576,000. So Realistically speaking, those are pretty close. Number one and two leading causes of death are, are neck and neck. They're pretty tight. But look at the third leading cause of death, chronic lower respiratory disease. Look at that number. It drops all the way down to 142,000. So we're going over from half a million down to 142,000 uh, from the number two to number three leading causes of death. So if we can focus a lot of our attention, which we have already this semester, but even moving onward, on trying to prevent our heart disease and cancers, we could potentially and drastically reduce the top two leading causes of death. So again, that is to show you the two top leading causes of death are heart disease and cancer, but also shows you how much higher they are than the other top 10 leading causes of death that's listed here. So again, if what we can do with our health and wellness um, journey is focus on helping prevent and manage the heart disease risk and cancer risks, you will greatly reduce your risks of these leading types of death that we experience. So causes of cancer, uh, there's obviously a few different causes, but there's internal factors which are genetics or hereditary or heredity. So family patterns for colon, stomach, prostate, breast, uterine, ovarian, and lung cancers. So if people in your family, whether that's parents or aunts and uncles or grandparents, um, have experienced certain these certain types of cancers, you could be at an increased risk because of the genetic factor. So if that is the case, then you need to make sure you pay special attention to those types of cancers and what you can do to either prevent them or also detect them early. 
uh, immune function. Only 5% are actually caused by viruses, and that is the human papilloma virus, which can be linked to cervical or penile cancers, and then hepatitis B and C can be linked to liver cancer. So again, that's only about 5% that are caused by the viruses. Okay, so uh, additional causes of cancer, we have our external factors. Uh, environmental exposure to carcinogens, work in settings, and frequent contact. Um, this isn't as prevalent now as it used to be, um, but back in um, you know, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 years ago, um, some of the building materials and products, et cetera, that some buildings were made of contain things like asbestos and so forth. Um, so being around that on a daily basis or frequent basis can certainly increase your risk for certain types of cancers. Um, but as we have learned more about that uh, here in recent years, uh, we have moved away from those building materials. We try to make safer building materials and obviously avoid uh, places that might have those type of carcinogens. So, uh, and every once in a while, you may even hear too on the, the radio or TV commercial, you know, if you worked in a certain industry and were exposed to this chemical or this, et cetera, whatever it is, you know, you might be um, eligible to receive you know, some type of benefit or compensation if you develop cancer or some other type of disease because of that. And that's what they're referring to is that exposure to the carcinogens. There's also radiation uh, only in high frequencies, which are ionizing and ultraviolet. Uh, the ultraviolet radiation obviously coming much from the sun, but basal and squamous cell cancers, which are mostly curable, but malignant melanoma can often be deadly. Um, so there's also different types of skin cancers. And there's about 9,500 deaths a year due to skin cancer. Um, and again, this is something that we probably don't talk about a whole lot with skin cancer. Um, but at the same time, looking at the climate where we live, typically being hot, uh, sunny for the majority part of the year, a lot of outdoor activities, uh, we can be at an increased risk just because of the environment in which we live and the climate of which we live in. So we need to pay a little bit closer attention to some of those than maybe somebody who does not live in such a uh, warm sunny climate. As far as lifestyle, uh, sun, so we just talked about sun, uh, making sure we're protecting ourselves with sun, uh, whether that's wearing some long sleeves or hats and sunscreen, etc. Um, avoid obviously alcohol uh, uh, or excessive alcohol consumption. Uh, talking about tobacco, you know, there's no secret there, but cigarettes and smoking and lung cancer, esophageal cancer, etc. But also with chewing tobacco, lip cancer, oral cancer, uh, things of the like, and then also diet. So you'll see how eating a healthier diet, particularly low fat and high fiber diet, can help reduce the risks uh, for certain types of cancer for you. So how diet can play a role in that as well. Um, so here is the uh, recommendations um, from the American Cancer Society back in 2012. So there's a lot of them to go through here. I'm not going to read every one of these on here, but again, you can uh, you know view these and see what it is. But as far as recommendations, uh, achieve and maintain a healthy weight throughout life. So so much of what we talked about is maintaining that healthy weight, that healthy body composition, and that's going to come from exercising and being more active, and also eating healthier, eating less fat diets, uh, eating smaller portion sizes etc. Um, again, the next bold point there is talking about being physically active. It even talks about adults trying to get at least 150 minutes of moderate intensity or 75 minutes of vigorous intensity each week. So we want to make sure that we're at least hitting that activity level. It even talks about children and teens, about one hour of activity each day can help prevent cancer or lower your risk for cancer. Uh, and that's becoming tougher. We talked early in the semester how that structure has changed, where now more and more kids are coming home from school and they're doing um, you know, iPads or video games. Uh, they're inside, they're not as out uh, active as what they used to be. Uh, even in that, taking the recesses and the uh, physical education classes out of the school setting, so they're not getting that activity throughout the school day. So that can be a challenge, particularly nowadays. Talks about eating a healthy diet with an emphasis on plant food. Um, so it's not saying that we don't need to eat meat or we can't eat meat, but that is saying that we also need to make sure that we are focusing on our fruits and our vegetables and our grains and things like that because of the nutrients they can provide for us can also help reduce the risk of developing certain types of cancer. Um, talks about uh, alcohol intake or limiting our alcohol intake so we don't want to excessively be drinking. 
Um, also talks about the, the public, private, and community organizations. So a lot of different things in terms of awareness, whether that's Breast Cancer Awareness Month, Relay for Life, et cetera, things like that that can help um, uh, educate the community, help uh, uh, create things where people might be able to get screened for certain types of cancer or whatever it may be, but at least bringing that information uh, to the community and to others within the community so they can learn how to protect themselves as well. So in terms of leading sites of new cancer and death, so here's two different things we wanna look at. If you look on the left-hand side, it talks about estimated new cases per year. So you can see that for male, the prostate cancer is the most prevalent type of cancer. For females, you can see that the breast cancer is the most prevalent type of cancer in females. However, if we move over to the right side, that column is estimated deaths. And you can see for both male and female that lung cancer is the number one killer. And that's something that you will need to know for the exam and test questions, et cetera, that the most common type of cancer in men is prostate. The most common type of cancer in female is breast. However, the number one cancer killer in both male and female is lung cancer. So make sure you know the difference between those and can see that. And then you can also see where they rank uh, in order from top to bottom, both in the number of new cases and then also estimated deaths associated with each type of cancer. Um, and obviously that's because some, some cancers are a little bit more treatable or curable than others. Uh, and this will identify that as well. So let me slide this over. So as far as types of cancer, hold on here. Technical difficulties. I don't know why that did that. Okay, so as far as types of cancer, we have our lung cancer, uh, which is the number one killer in men and women. Um, cigarettes, secondhand smoke, et cetera. Uh, we have done a much better job as, as a society um, taking care of the cigarettes as far as um, you know, banning them from public places, restaurants, uh, et cetera. Uh, and I even think, I, I don't know if these laws have taken into effect yet, but I know at some point they've talked about making it illegal to smoke in a vehicle that has children in it, uh, again, because of the risks and the dangers of secondhand smoke and so forth, particularly to those um, children. Uh, radiation, radon, and asbestos. Uh, and then symptoms could include persistent cough, um, blood street spectrum, uh, chest pain, reoccurring pneumonia, and bronchitis. Um, survival rate is pretty slim. And one of the reasons the survival rate is pretty slim is because there's no effective early detection modalities. So if you were to look at some of those symptoms, persistent cough or chest pain or pneumonia, that's nothing out of the ordinary. Many people experience a cough. You know, they might get a cough or a cold uh, when the weather changes, or they might experience a little bit of chest pain here and there. And some of you guys may even have had pneumonia and bronchitis uh, before because they're not that uncommon. So that's one of the reasons the survival rate is slim with lung cancer is when somebody develops a persistent cough, they think it's simply a cough and by the time that it persists long enough or they think that there may be something additionally wrong, and then they identify that there's cancer at that time, times that cancer has already spread, um, and now it's all at a higher stage, which obviously is less likely to be curable because of how much cancer has spread throughout the body. So again, that's one of the reasons that the lung cancer has a low survival rate is because it's so hard to detect early. All right, let's bounce back over here. I don't know why this is doing that with my screen, but let's see if this works here. Okay, um, so additional types of cancer. We have breast cancer, which is the leading type of cancer in women. Remember, it's not the number one killer. It's the leading type, uh, but it is the number two killer in women. So some risks that are associated with that are increased age. So just like everything else, as our age increases, our likelihood for certain types of diseases increase and that's no different with breast cancer. Um, family history, so again, if a mother or grandmother, aunt or some, something along those lines have had breast cancer, then you need to pay closer attention because you're also at an increased risk. Uh, early menarche, so if you started your period earlier than uh, other girls or women um, could be a risk factor, and then also late menopause as well could be a risk factor for developing breast cancer. Modifiable factors associated with lower risks. So these are things that you can control that are modifiable, um, but breastfeeding, breastfeeding has been shown to lower the risk of breast cancer. Uh, moderate or vig vigorous physical activity. So being physical, physically active 
can certainly help in that department and lowering your risk of breast cancer. And so can maintaining a healthy body weight. So having a low body composition or body fat percentage, having a healthy weight, and that's going to come with eating a healthy diet and then also exercising or being more physically act, act, uh, excuse me, active. So, so sim some symptoms could include uh, lumps or a harder, hardening on the breasts, some dimpling of the skin, pain and tenderness around the nipples, and even in some cases, a nipple discharge. Um, so it is recommended that you have a monthly exam and then clinical breast exams and mammograms. Um, and that's one thing that you're gonna see with a few of the different types of cancers that we talk about today are the recommended se uh, monthly self-exam. Uh, and this is one thing that I will point out too, is that you know your body better than anybody else. You know what it looks like, you know what it feels like, you know how it behaves in certain situations, et cetera. If there is anything that you notice out of the ordinary, if something looks different, if it feels different, if you touch it and something different happens or whatever it may be, if there's a little more pain or tenderness in one area than, than what usually is, if there's anything out of the ordinary, it's always a good idea to at least get that checked out because that could be a sign or a symptom, not just of cancer, but of any type of disease or health concern that you would want to take care of. So again, monthly self exams are critical in detecting these types of diseases early. Uh, and again, the earlier that you can detect them, the more uh, curable they are, the higher your success rate would be. Uh, prostate cancer, um, it is the leading cancer in men. It's also the number two killer in men in terms of prostate, obviously lung cancer being number one. So some risk factors here include age, the older you get, obviously family history, just like many of the other cancers. If anybody in your family has had that type of cancer, you're at an increased risk. Um, African Americans and dietary fat. So eating a diet high in fats can <clears throat> increase your risk or likelihood of developing prostate cancer. Some symptoms could include painful urination or abnormal urination. So again, anything out of the ordinary, if you're going to the restroom, urinating more often, if it's painful, more painful than what it is sometimes, et cetera, that is something out of the ordinary and could indicate that you do need to get that checked out. Uh, recommended digital rectal exam over 40 years old and then blood tests after the age of 50. And survival rate can be pretty good because a lot of times it can be detected early enough to where they can go in there and uh, cure and prevent the spread of that uh, for an increased survival rate. Now, oh, why my screen keeps doing that, so I apologize. But uh, going back to other types of cancer, we have colon and rectal cancer. It is the number three killer amongst men and women. Uh, risks are inactivity, high fat, low fiber diet, and family history. So even looking at the risk factors for colon cancer, three, uh, I'm sorry, two of the three are preventable. Inactivity, you can, you can dictate how active you are. And then high fat, low fiber diet, you can change that by eating a low fat, high fiber diet. So two out of those three that you can control. Obviously you can't control your family history, but it is something to be aware of because if you do have a family history of colon or rectal cancer, that just means you need to pay a little bit closer attention, maybe get some self exams, um, some screenings, et cetera. Um, so symptoms could be change in bowel habits, rectal bleeding or blood in the stool. So again, anything different than what is ordinary uh, is certainly worth getting checked out. Recommended rectal exams, fecal blood test, sigmoidoscopy and colonoscopies. And a lot of that stuff is included in your yearly examinations, particularly as you get older or even have a family history of that. The doctor may wanna check that on a more frequent basis. And again, the survival rate can be pretty good if detected early enough. So you're seeing more and more how the earlier it is detected, the better the survival rate is. Okay, so testicular cancer. Most common in men between the ages of 15 and 34. Um, so I'm gonna go out on a limb and say the majority of people watching this right now, or majority of men watching this are probably within that age range. So you guys are at your highest risk throughout your life for testicular cancer. So something that you do wanna pay a little bit more attention to. The causes are unclear. Um, some may be genetic, some may be environmental. Uh, not really sure exactly what may cause um, testicular cancer. Maybe be trauma to the area. You know, if you were hit or kicked there, uh, you know, when you were younger and there was some type of trauma to the testicle area, maybe could increase your risk uh, for testicular cancer. But symptoms include swelling or enlargement of testic excuse me, testicular area. 
and self exams are recommended. So again, just like everything else, you know what you feel like and look like. And if anything feels or looks out of the ordinary, it's certainly worth getting checked out. Um, and again, you know, taking a shower, you know, on a daily basis, um, you know, it doesn't take but just a few seconds to check to make sure everything is still the same and, and functioning properly, et cetera. Um, so make sure you're trying to incorporate these little self exams, um, you know, at least on a monthly basis or something like that, because it could really protect yourself and help you detect some type of these uh, cancers or other diseases earlier on. So skin cancer, it is one of the most preventable types of cancer. Again, that's because we can protect ourselves uh, a lot of times from these different ultraviolet rays, sun, et cetera. Um, risk factors and prevention, monthly skin self-checks and professional skin checks. So whether you go to a dermatologist or something like that. Uh, but again, you can see your skin, you can look at it, you can see if there is a mole or a marking or a color change um, you know, on a regular basis, you can look at that and if something changes. And we'll, we're gonna show you some pictures here uh, in a few slides that will indicate that or show you exactly what you should be looking for. Uh, basal cell and squamous cell carcinomas. You have non-melanoma skin cancer. Most are curable, especially if caught early. So again, there it is again, if caught early, that's early detection. And the way that you can detect it early is either doing your self-examinations or visiting with a dermatologist and having them look on a frequent basis as well. And then you have melanoma, which is the deadliest form of skin cancer. So if you were to progress through, you can look at this YouTube video um, and it's certainly something that you're going to want to take a look at. There will be some test questions and quiz questions associated with this video. Um, but this video is uh, it's about a 15 minute long video talking about the dangers of skin cancer um, and how so many people overlook that danger. The way they're not wearing sunscreen, not worrying about sunburns, not a big deal, panning and so on and so forth. And how so many of us just kind of do that all the time but really how dangerous that can be and how likely or, or how much that could increase our risk for uh, developing certain types of skin cancer. So it really puts thing in, in, things in perspective. And again, with a climate that we live in that much of the year is warm and sunny and have so many outdoor activities, we really need to be protecting ourselves against the sun and what that can do for us or to us. Um, so some things to look for, the ABCs of melanoma. Uh, so some different things as you're doing your self checks or even what the dermatologist will look for. Uh, but the ABCD stands for asymmetry. So something that is different. So one half looks different than the other. It may be the shape that looks different. It may be the coloring that looks different. You can see on that top picture that one side is darker than the other. So that's not symmetrical. They look different on both sides. Uh, border irregularity. So you can see in that second picture um, from the top that that border is not a regular shape. It's not a circle, it's not an oval, it's not a consistent pattern. It has a lot of irregularity to that. Um, color, so benign moles can be any color. Uh, so non-cancerous moles is what's that meaning, might be any color, but at the same time, one single mole is usually a solid color. So many of us have had moles for all of our life and you know where they're at, you can see them. But in most cases, uh, and they may even be um, different shades throughout the body, but one particular mole should be the same color. If you notice that within one mole or one spot, there's some lighter spots, darker spots, or different coloring or hues or saturations, et cetera, uh, then that might be something to get checked out, might be something of concern. And then diameter. So melanomas continue to grow. Uh, so just like we talked about earlier, cancer cells typically grow and spread. Uh, the melanomas are no different. So if you notice that a mole is continuing to increase in size or to get bigger over the years or over the weeks or over the months, whatever it is, um, certainly something that you would want to take a closer look at and get checked out. So some warning signs and symptoms um, just in general. So it depends on where the cancer is, how big it is, how much organ or tissue it has affected. But some general signs of cancer could, could include unexplained weight loss. Uh, fever, pain, skin changes, et cetera. So again, anything out of the ordinary, anything that's not normal um, would be something to indicate it, it could potentially be cancer. Um, and, and it could also be another type of disease that's, that's worth being checked on. Um, so you can take proper, uh, proper measurements from that standpoint moving forward. Other symptoms of specific cancers, we have the acronym CAUTION. So that C stands for change in bladder or bowel habits or appearance. A, sore that does not heal, unusual bleeding or discharge, whether that's in the mouth, the penis, the vagina, thickening or lump in breast testicles or any other part of the body, 
indigestion or difficulty swallowing, which might also lead to rapid weight loss, obvious change in a wart or mole, and that could be size, color, or even sometimes they could uh, bleed or, or be uh, rather itchy, uh, nagging cough or hoarseness. So again, those are some basic signs and symptoms. Um, so if any of those are out of the ordinary for you, again, certainly something you want to take a closer look at. So in terms of cancer treatment, we can do a lot of things to help prevent or reduce our risk of cancer. Number one is obviously no smoking and not just smoking, but no tobacco use at all. Uh, protect our skin. So again, whether that's wearing sunscreen, reapplying sunscreen, wearing a long sleeve shirt, um, you know, whatever it is, a hat, uh, staying in the shade during that, that middle part of the day, uh, whatever it may be, um, could help uh, prevent some cancer. Uh, avoid unnecessary radiation. That's why if you ever go get an x-ray or something, you notice the x-ray technician always leaves the room. That's so they're not exposed to, uh, you know, unnecessary radiation in there. Avoid excessive alcohol consumption. Make sure you're eating a good diet, particularly a low-fat, high-fiber diet. Minimize occupational environmental exposure and make sure you are exercising regularly. Early detection is key, just like we saw with everything else. The earlier you can detect it, the better your survival rate is. Um, and regular screenings and exams are the only way that you're going to detect it early. So make sure you're implementing that into your daily, uh, yearly, monthly routine, etc. So methods of treatment, there is different types of surgeries. There's radiation, which helps target tumors with the x-rays, uh, chemotherapy, chemical combination that kills cells or prevent cell division, so it tries to prevent them from growing and spreading, and then immunotherapy, strengthening the body's own immune system so it becomes more efficient at eliminating the cancer cells itself. Okay, so shifting gears now. So that kind of wraps up the cancer portion of it. So now we're gonna look at the diabetes portion of it. And we've talked about diabetes a little bit throughout the semester, uh, but just kind of going a little bit more in depth, but deficiency of insulin or inability of the body to use insulin and that's the difference between type 1 and type 2, which we'll talk about. Uh, insulin is a hormone secreted by the pancreas that carries glucose from the blood into the cells for energy. So it's utilized for energy production. It is the sixth leading cause of death. So it is uh, you know, still in that top 10, so it's relatively high there. Type 1 is insulin dependent, and type 2 is non-insulin dependent. And we'll touch on that a little bit more here. So type 1 diabetes, about 10% of cases, so the, the vast minority of cases are actually type 1 diabetes. And it's usually diagnosed in children and teens because it's typically something that you're born with, uh, and they can identify that pretty early on in life. Uh, and it's, it's, you produce little or no insulin, and therefore you need a daily injection of insulin. So either maybe you or somebody you know growing up may have type 1 diabetes, and you might remember them having to give themselves an injection on a daily basis. Um, that's what that is. So some symptoms could include uh, increased thirst or increased urination, weight loss, uh, blurred vision, constantly being hungry, uh, extreme fatigue or always being tired, and if untreated, life-threatening coma can result. So many type 1 diabetics, um, you know, have, you know, insulin with them, have an injection with them in case there is some type of uh, life-threatening situation that they can use. Sometimes even you might have seen somebody who has sugar that needs some sugar to help with that too you know, candy bar or something like that can sometimes help through those um, life-threatening situations as well. Okay, so type 2 diabetes, which is about 90% of all cases, so the vast majority of diabetics are actually type 2 diabetes, and it usually begins around the age of 40 uh, and over. However, it is increasing in younger groups due to our increased obesity rate and the younger populations becoming more obese. It is most often lifestyle related. If you remember back to previous chapters, 85% of the people who are diagnosed with type 2 diabetes were obese at the time of diagnosis. And most obesity could be prevented, most of it could be prevented by living a healthier lifestyle, eating healthier, uh, physical activity, exercise, etc. Uh, so that's why I say most, most often lifestyle related. Uh, you produce enough insulin, but the cells are resistant, so you're not able to utilize them, the, utilize the insulin the way that it should. Uh, type 1 is more common in whites, so the type 1 diabetes is more common in whites. Uh, type 2 is more common in older people, the overweight or obese, and non-whites. And Native Americans actually have the highest risk factor for type 2 diabetes. So some treatment 
uh, for type 2 diabetes or uh, is diabetes really, but diet. So monitor your dietary glucose. You don't want to eat near as much sugars and then also reduce the amount of fat that you're intaking. Exercise increases insulin sensitivity. So you become more efficient at using the insulin that your body produces. Um, also exercise helps prevent obesity. So like we talked about again, 85% of the people diagnosed with type two diabetes were obese at the time of diagnosis. So you prevent obesity, you can reduce your risk uh, or to help treat uh, type two diabetes. 90% um, of type two may be preventable with diet and exercise. So that's a huge, uh, the vast majority of type 2 diabetes could be preventable just by eating healthier and being more active. Use of insulin. So diet and exercise can cut the need for medication for type 2 diabetes because your body begins to use it uh, more effectively. Okay, so moving on to the last topic for today, talking about osteoporosis. Uh, we've touched on it a little bit, uh, but just going a little bit more in depth here, it is the decrease in bone mass or bone density uh, throughout your lifetime, which makes your bones more fragile and likely to fracture. Some common sites might be the hip, the spine, and the wrist. So, um, you know, it's probably not that uncommon, but you hear of an elderly person falling, and most often it's not just a fall, but it's a fall that results in a break, a bone breaking or fracturing. A lot of times it's gonna be the hip, spine, or wrist because that's what they fall on. They fall on their hip, or they fall and they put their hand down uh, and land on their wrist to try to break their fall and they end up breaking their wrist. Um, so a fall that may not affect somebody who's in their 20s and 30s to the same person who may be 80 or 90 and experiencing osteoporosis, that fall might now mean a hospital stay because they have broken or fractured a bone. Bone mass reaches peak at age 35 and then it begins to decline. And throughout that uh, declining period, women can lose up to 30 to 50% of their uh, bone density, bone mass, men can lose 20 to 30 percent of their bone mass so obviously with those numbers there you can see that it is four times more likely to develop in male or i'm sorry in females than it is male so women that's something that you also want to pay closer attention to uh, as well okay so some risk factors associated with osteoporosis just like everything else age so obviously increasing age increased risk factors for osteoporosis gender would be women race caucasian and asian Bone structure and weight. So thin, small bone women are at a greater risk because they have less bone mass to start off with. So, you know, if they were to lose 50% of what they already have, they're going to be at a much uh, reduced risk of uh, reduced amount of bone mass. So menopause and menstrual history. So early menopause, uh, loss of menstruation due to eating disorders or excessive physical activity uh, could also be uh, high, our, uh, increase your risk factor for developing osteoporosis as well. Um, cigarette smoking is another big risk factor of osteoporosis. Diet and exercise, so talking about not getting enough calcium. Um, obviously, the goal is to get enough calcium throughout a healthy diet, but there's also calcium supplements. So if a doctor may feel that it is a concern that you're not getting enough calcium, um, you know, you can take a calcium supplement over the counter, uh, you know, no big deal. Um, no weight bearing uh, exercises. Um, so we want to make sure that we include weight bearing exercises. That's where you're having to support your body weight or support an external weight um, because just like a muscle, a muscle lifts a weight to put a stress on it so that muscle can become stronger. Your bones are no different. Your bones need to have some stress applied to them. They need to be able to have some weight bearing exercises so they can rebuild and maintain their strength, their density, their bone mass. Family history, uh, reduced bone mass may be hereditary. So again, if it is in your um, family history, it's something you're gonna wanna pay a little bit more closer attention to as well. So the role of diet and exercise, um, you wanna increase your peak bone mass early in life. So again, your peak bone mass uh, is at 35 years old. So basically up until you're 35, you wanna do everything you can to increase your bone mass. And that is by having a healthy diet and exercise. Uh, make sure you're including weight-bearing activities. Make sure you're having uh, enough calcium intake, et cetera. And then you also want to reduce bone, mount, bone loss later in life by doing the same things. So it talks about physical activities, weight-bearing, uh, walking, running, racket sports, weight training, skiing. Anything, again, that you're on your feet and supporting your body weight is a weight-bearing activity. And then also diet calcium throughout your lifetime, about 800 to 1,200 milligrams a day. Um, should be your goal. And again, that can be easily attained throughout a healthy diet. 
But at the same time, if you are lacking in that particular area or the doctor feels that that is a concern, um, you know, you can also take some uh, calcium supplements to make sure you are getting that recommended daily amount of 800 to 1200 milligrams per day. So, <clears throat> excuse me, that wraps up chapter nine. We've touched on um, cancer, we've touched on diabetes, we've touched on osteo osteoporosis, and please do not forget to watch that YouTube link uh, on one of the previous slides. Um, that YouTube link, uh, it, like I said, it's about a 15 minute video that really shows you um, the risks associated with the sun and skin cancer and melanomas and the devastating effect that it can have and why we need to do a better job protecting ourselves and our skin uh, against those types of things. So. Uh, hope you found this helpful. Again, if you have questions, uh, please send me an email. Uh, other than that, I will get chapter 10 out to you, uh, and you'll have one more chapter to take care of your online assessments, your quizzes, your assignments, et cetera, uh, and then also use this to prepare for that unit three exam. So thanks, guys, and have a great day.